Uh, welcome everyone to today's talk. Uh, we're honored to have uh, Dr. Hamid Sharif uh, speak on the state of wireless communications in North American freight railroads. He's been working on this topic for a long time and I'm looking forward to an interesting talk. So Dr. Sharif. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Rilet, I appreciate the inviting me to come here and Matsi to provide this opportunity for me. Um, as the title is, I'm going to talk about the state of the wireless for railroad, specifically in area of freight railroads and uh, what the North American industry has done uh, about this area. Let's see if this goes through. Okay. Wireless communications, uh, I guess some folks are joining us, please. Um, wireless communication, communications, of course, has impacted every aspect of our lives and, uh, and uh, impacted the surface transportation and uh, specifically the railroad. The Federal Railroad Administration, in their strategic plan, uh, identified, I read this line to you, that communication is one of the critical, the most critical areas to collect, process, and disseminate information to improve safety, security, and operational effectiveness of the railroad. So they realized that uh, wireless communication plays a very important role for how to manage railroads, how to improve the safety, and how to provide better security for the surface transportation in area of railroads. With that important factor here, if you look at where we are in railroads, in terms of the wireless communication, the voice still is over infrastructure that is 30 plus years old. Still, the people on the locomotive, they have the radio that they are communicating with the control centers. The quality of the radio and communication has got better, but it still is over that radio link. In terms of the data, they send data over a protocol called Advanced Train Control System, which was put together in 1980s, and at best, that can provide 4,800 to 9,600 bits per second. When you look at that kind of data rate, that's not any match for any application that we are doing specifically in the area of multimedia. But that's what they have. This is the link that between we have between locomotive and the control uh, centers at the different railroads. So everybody realized that something should be done here. They looked at a solution that would provide a technology for current and the future of railroads. Um, we were uh, supported through a grant by Federal Railroad Administration to investigate what would be the suitable technology for the railroad for the current applications and the future applications. Basically, the objectives were to make sure we have a high-speed data network for moving trains, make sure that uh, the trains crew have real-time uh, accessibility to internet and provide information to the crews in different control centers or ground crews and implement that into safety applications and operation. This project was supported by Federal Railroad Administration and major railroads in North America, which I have listed here, all supported this project, provided funding for us and resources. Some of these you know, Union Pacific, of course, headquartered in Omaha, BNSF, uh, CSX, is supporting Southeast US, like, like Florida and that area, Norfolk Southern Railway, and two the railways from Canada, the Canadian National and Canadian Pacific. So all of these supported this project because they wanted to see what would be a standard technology for the railroad communication that all of them can implement that will provide interoperability between them. Now, before I talk about uh, how this technology uh, should be, they wanted the standard uh, technology, meaning that no proprietary uh, technology, because different railroads wanted, wanted to interoperate with each other. 
So if there was a solution from one sector of industry, then they were limited in terms of buying from that sector of industry and getting all the support from that. But they wanted something that was a standard. So they could buy hardware from everyone and develop it themselves. The way that we looked at this project was uh, our methodology based on three components. Of course, we had uh, some uh, analytical modeling and uh, let me see if I can move this around. We did some uh, mathematical modeling based on what the needs are for the current applications of the railroad, what are the future needs. Then we built a, a computer simulation model to provide us scalability in terms of what the performance should be. And then we build a test bed to test the data that we are getting from our mathematical models and simulations. Um, the first technology that we looked at was Wi-Fi. Let me explain about this. When you talk about the uh, wireless communication for railroads, a um, couple of technologies come to the mind. The first one, everybody says, well, why don't we use satellite? Why don't we have a satellite communications that supports all the trains? Satellite is a technology that we looked at. it, But of course, uh, it has its own problem. The problem with the satellite, the cost is very high. For example, Union Pacific has 6,000 locomotives. Putting equipment to receive and transmit to the satellite over every locomotive for is very expensive, very high. Secondly, technically, some of the satellites do not provide, uh, do not support critical missions. A satellite like 20,000 miles above the Earth, the latency, the delay that, that goes information back and forth is very long for some of the critical applications. It's OK for voice and all that, but if you are controlling something on locomotive, satellite wasn't a good option. So satellite is not an option. The second option, people say, why don't we use a cellular network? The wireless communication that we have, we have our cell phone, a smartphone. Why don't we use that over the uh, railroad? You don't realize that um, railroad, especially freight railroad, goes through some of the areas that cellular doesn't have any coverage. You go some of in western Nebraska and you find that you don't have any coverage on your phone. So cellular is not a, a solution. Then we looked at, as I said, the first phase was Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is a very mature technology. Uh, everybody is using. It has advantages in terms of the throughput. The data rate is high enough that supports applications. The frequency is not a license ban, meaning that if the railroad wanted to use it, they didn't have to pay money for the license uh, fee. But Wi-Fi, as all of us have experienced that, you use it in a stationary environment. You use it in a building. You're using it in a campus. It's not used in a mobile environment. When you have a mobility, the signal is going to be affected when you're moving like 70 miles an hour. This is different from using your Wi-Fi in a stationary place. Many people believe that Wi-Fi is not designed for mobile environment. But railroad wanted us to study and see if that can be used for mobile environment. We actually got into a discussion with some of the industry that are selling equipment to railroads. And they told us it's not possible. It's not supported. So we did some mathematical modeling. And we found that, no, it, it supports mobility up to some level. That level was like 70 miles an hour. But that was through our mathematical models. And uh, it gave us a little bit confidence, but we needed to uh, expand that study. So we built our um, simulation model. We got the same data. And then we started building a test bed to really see if that works with the, the hardware that is available today. So in doing the Wi-Fi project, some of the things that we wanted to look at, we wanted to look at the performance in terms of the throughput. Is that good enough for some of the railroad applications? Does it support quality of service? Quality of service meaning that you are running applications that are time dependent. right? If you are sending video, for example, if some frames are not in the right order and are delayed, the quality of that is decreased. 
So we wanted to see if that is supported by Wi-Fi. And also, we wanted to see if that works for a railroad environment. Railroad environment is very harsh environment. You have a locomotive that generates massive electromagnetic field. Will that work with the Wi-Fi? So these were the things that we were looking at. And then I'm mentioning some of the technical issues. These are more things that we as electrical engineers look at. For example, signal fading. That's an issue when you are going around two trains and all that, the signal can fade. The Doppler shift when you have different velocity is there. The multi signal is going to transmit from, let's say, locomotive to the base station. You could have different obstacle. And as you are moving, that is going to magnify the noise issue, the error that is generating. So our study wasn't just to see if this is going to work or not. We had to look at the technical issues in area of the signal and see if that works. In terms of simulation, we built our simulation to look at all of these issues. The way that we model this, there wasn't any the model available to look at all these issues for environment like a railroad. So we had to build many of these computer simulation models ourselves. We added all these components to it. We added shadowing. We added fragmentation. We added multiple channels. We added synchronization. We added the authentication. These were the issues that we built our model around. It. The test bed, I was looking at an area that will give us a true representation of railroad environment. And in Nebraska, I found Crete, Nebraska, which is about 30 miles from here, a good area. Because if you have gone through Crete here, there are some hills over there. There are some foliage, trees, bushes, and all that. And then the city, the city town of Crete over there gave us an opportunity to be outside the town, out of town. And then you get into the city, how this is changing. And in addition to that, UP and BNSF had the track over there that we could test that. And the last thing was the track that is in Crete has a parallel road to it. That when we didn't have access to the live track, we could uh, take our cars over there and go and drive on the road parallel to track and do our testing. So we got support from uh, AAR, uh, BNSF, UP, CSX, and CN to build this test bed. This test bed it's three and a half miles. It still is out there. If you go to Crete, uh, you can see, uh, if you look at the, where the railroad track is, uh, you see our test bed. I want to show you this test bed, what it's about. Logically, logically, what we have done is we have put eight of these masses and our antennas on top of that. And they are communicating back and forth. And then from one end, we are coming to DSL and going to the BNSF core network. The other side, we are coming to a microwave link and then going through the BNSF. So we have this loop here, and the train goes alongside of this. This is a logical um, topology for it. If you look at the actual test bed, this is the actual test bed. We have a segment that is a straight segment here. These are our access points. You see that we have eight of these. Then we have some curves here. And then you see there are foliage here. You see the water going, the river going by here. So a lot of trees here, hills here. And then we get to area of the creek here. This circle that you see here is the coverage for each access point. I wanted to look at some of these that we don't have any overlap, like between this one and this one. And then we had some overlap. And looking at the signal quality, how this was changing. This row 33 is the one that I was talking about that is parallel to the track. You see that when we wanted to do our testing, this was very nice. Um, some of these, we had to test the velocity and how fast we were running. Uh, this row 33 is, has a speed limit of 55 miles. And of course, we wanted to test it for 70, 75 miles. And a couple times we got into trouble and we were stopped. And we tried to explain to the officer that we are testing, really. And he didn't buy that. He was wondering what we were doing because we had this car and we have all these antennas on top of it. And I had some international students in the car with me. And this officer wondered what we are doing in the middle of Nebraska. Um, and uh, so we got the ticket on this. and uh, we. Uh, 
I had hard time um, convincing FRA people that's a part of our cost for doing this. <laughs> so um, um, these are some pictures from our test bed. This is one of our antennas here. You see, you see the curve here. How the curve is? We wanted to see that the foliage here. We looked at our testing during the winter when we didn't have any leaves. In the spring and summer when we have a lot of leaves, effect of these on the transmission is a big deal. One leaf of a tree may have impact the same as if you have two bricks next to each other and you're sending signal through. So it impacts uh, the transmission. Um, uh, this is relatively the uh, segment that we had over there. And these are our antennas that we put, in, put up there. Some of that we were outside the uh, creek, so we had to have the power generator to power our radios. Our antennas are up there. The radio is here, and these are my graduate students. Very cheap operation. We had the lawn chair. We take it over there, connect our system. And, and as the train go by, the track is up here. Um, we were monitoring the transmission. Um, this is a better picture. Of course, DNSF was coming to make sure that we are following the safety rules. And, and, um, and this was good. Uh, the power generator, it was giving us power for about five to eight hours operation. But I wanted to monitor this 24 hours. So um, uh, we talked to the railroads. And the UP supported us to get some um, uh, cell cells here, and then so we have cellular coverage here. Then we have some batteries here that uh, is collecting power here. And uh, they had to bring and fix some of this because this was low level and water was coming into our base station. Um, so UP supported this for us. You know, so now we had 24 hour coverage uh, from our system. Um, again, this is some of our pictures from uh, when we were testing. And uh, in terms of getting uh, on the live tra track, BNSF was pretty good supporting us with the locomotive. And this is the University of Nebraska test bed that we are using, and some other people were using that. Uh, notice all the graffitis on this. Every time we bring it to Lincoln over there, the next day we get more graffitis on this. Um, some of our testing that required the velocity testing, they told me that um, let's see why it moves. Um, if a locomotive pulls or push, the velocity may be different. And because we want to be very exact, they gave us two locomotives. So at any given time, one was pushing. And if we wanted to reverse it, the other one was pushing. So uh, was there. And then we had to have another rail car here because of the weight distribution. And uh, so we're doing all of this testing. And uh, as I mentioned, the, the methodology for our testing was to get the information from our model and analytical uh, models and compare it with what we are getting from the test bed. Um, one of these that we did was um, we were getting the GPS information from what was in the test bed, and we put that in our analytical and simulation model and compare the results. Um, when we were doing this testing, we find out that doing the actual test uh, over the track, we don't have a good equipment to monitor this. We even have good test tools. So that forced us to generate, to write our own test tool. We wrote uh, this test tool that graphically shows where we are moving. And on the side of that is providing all the information. Later on, railroads find out that we have these test, test tools, and everybody was interested to get a copy of it. And we send it to them, and they're using it now. It's a very graphical test tool uh, for Wi-Fi, and it's monitoring the, where you're moving, and will give you the throughput, and the RSSI, and some of the other information. Also, we looked at the antenna. Uh, uh, placing on the rail cars. Uh, mathematically, we had to build the model for it. And uh, here, visually, you can see where the antenna should be for better coverage. For example, here, the antenna is over here. This red is good coverage. And as you can see, the coverage, uh, the other side of these rail cars are getting less and less. This was important because railroad were asking us, 
should they put the antenna here or at the edge here or what is the best place? So we did the study part of that. This graph is an old graph, but uh, what it showed is data that we collected in the test bed. The characteristics of that, we put it in our computer simulation model and we, we compare the simulation versus the actual data. And you see it's pretty matching pretty good. The red one is what we're getting from the computer simulation and the blue is what we actually collected from the test bed. Uh, it matches pretty good. The, the only thing is there's a spike here that uh, our simulation didn't have this. And we were digging in to find out what happened here. And we went back on the video and we found out that at that point there was a truck passing by our transmission and blocked this. So uh, affected that. So that was one of the things that we didn't have in the simulation. Um, People who didn't believe us that uh, Wi-Fi can support mobility, so we generated this graph from our test bed. This one is showing the throughput versus how fast we are moving. For example, we moved up to 30 miles. I mean, here it comes to the 30 miles. And when we turn around, you see the speed comes down that we are turning around and then going back to 30 miles. And at that point, we looked at the throughput, and we saw the throughput always stayed close to 6 megabits per second. So that showed us at different velocity here we get to close to 55 miles and maybe 60, uh, 60 miles. Our throughput for different variation of Wi-Fi has supported uh, close to 6 megabits, 1 megabit, 4 megabits. These different uh, speed here depends on different variation of Wi-Fi 802.11 that we are using. It's not that the speed is reduced, it's just the different variation of that. I'm talking about 802.11, A, B, G, different speed that we're testing. So uh, after we showed that we have the right throughput, we wanted to know how far we are supporting the coverage for the Wi-Fi. And uh, again, we did some simulation, and we got the field data. And in general, what we learned from that is if you are moving at 50, uh, 50 to 70 miles per hour with the Wi-Fi, with a throughput of like six miles, the distance that you get is about uh, no more than one mile, 1,600 uh, meters. It's about, uh, you feel that you can go about 1,000 meters, one kilometer, that's a good coverage. Now, is this good or bad? That's something that the railroad has to decide. So in general, in finding that we had for Wi-Fi was that, OK, is good. Uh, unlicensed frequency, supports mobility up to 70 miles. But the drawbacks for that was the communication is limited to a mile, meaning that if the railroad is going to support the communication for all the tracks, every mile they had to put a, a, one of these base stations, which is expensive. So that doesn't work for supporting the tracks all the way. Uh, also, Wi-Fi has a limited number of the channels, doesn't support the quality of service. So it has some pluses and minuses. So we sat down with the railroads and we told them this is what we found out. They, they accepted that this is not going to support the communication for the tracks all the way, but it's going to support the application for the yards, yards where the train is coming to the yard. So what they have done with this is they took out a study and they have implemented Wi-Fi in about maybe about four or five miles before each yard. So as the train is coming to the yard, this Wi-Fi connection is getting information from the locomotive and give, passes that to the people in the yard. So when the train gets to the yard, they know exactly what kind of service they're going to provide for that locomotive. So this is used. Also, they are using what we did here for the wireless communication within the yard. But this is not the solution for providing the uh, uh, communication alongside of the track. So they told us, all right, so what, so what is the solution for if we want to have coverage alongside of the tracks earlier? So we looked at the mobile WiMAX. Mobile WiMAX is a technology that is designed for mobility. And Theoret said that the distance Wi-Fi, we had one mile. Now they said, well, you can support up to 30 miles. 
So railroads were very interested to find out, well, 30 miles is very good. Can you do that? So we looked at this. And <coughs> these are some of the highlights for what is uh, this standard advertises. 30 miles, 70 miles per uh, second throughput. It supports up to 120 miles uh, per hour of speed. Supports quality of service. So some of the things that Wi-Fi didn't have, WiMAX is saying that it had. So they asked us to look at this and see if truly this is supporting that kind of uh, thing. The problem with WiMAX is Wi-Fi all of us are using. This is in 2.4 gigahertz. This is license free, unlicensed, so any Wi-Fi here. But if you go to use WiMAX, WiMAX operates at 2.5 gigahertz, which that frequency is purchased by Sprint and Clearwire. So it's not free. Nobody can just set up a WiMAX uh, wireless at their home or campus and all that. So for us to do the testing, we had to get the permission from um, uh, Clearwire, because Nebraska was falling under the Clearwire. Clearwire is a company that had their license and a sprint. Clearwire didn't want to give us the permission. They wanted to know exactly what we are doing and why we are doing this. Even though probably they never do anything in this area, but they didn't want to give us um, permission to use that. Later on, they came back and they wanted to charge us for the usage of the license, uh, that frequency. And uh, of course, we didn't have that funding. But when we started digging into this, we found out that the University of Nebraska has received permission to use some of this frequency for educational things a few years ago before WiMAX was big. And uh, so we said, well, we are using this for educational thing here. So with that, uh, um, with that uh, permission, we could do WiMAX around Omaha and around Lincoln with a radius of 35 miles. And there wasn't anything that a sprint or clear wire could do that. Uh, so that really gave us a, <coughs> a big boost to do this study. WiMAX is a little bit different. Um, the way that we wanted to look at is the same thing. Those access points that we had before for uh, Wi-Fi, now we are going to put the WiMAX on it. And then we wanted to look at the train communication in multiple trains. Now, if you have a train, this may come to a, one of these access points and then go to a service gateway and the control center. And then another one could be connected to uh, different base stations. The issue was here now if you have multiple trains at different velocity, different direction, how that is, that is going to impact the performance of that. So we had to build our own simulation model again. And our simulation model is listed here. The simulation model that commercially is available through OpNet and QualiNet are in these columns. And then there were some in Taiwan, Italy, and national. In, uh, Institute of the Standard. But our model that we put together has more of these wires, yes, meaning that supporting more of these there. So we built this for the railroad, and this is available to them. And now is a part of um, Federal Railroad Administration tool that they provided to railroads. But through this model, we looked at different scenarios. Um, we looked at the uh, throughput. And these are different frequencies, different modulation techniques that are used. Uh, our simulation with the test bed and the theory are very close. I mean, just, just look at it there. This modulation, of course, gives us the best uh, throughput here that we can get close to 25 uh, the megabits per second. The thing that was important was this graph. Remember the Wi-Fi was the distance was one kilometer. Now look at the distance here. The distance here goes uh, to 12,000 meters, 12 kilometers, right? It wasn't really the 30 miles that they advertised, and it's not going to be at high data rate. If you're going to say high data rate, then the limit is only close to 3.5 miles or so. It's not 30 miles. But if you reduce your throughput data that you're sending to something like less than uh, 4 megabits per second, then you can send something close to 11 miles or so. So this was much better than that. So this was very important for the railroads to see this graph, because 
what they are advertising that you get a high data rate for high distance is not really true. High data rate is true, but for lower distance and uh, and vice versa. So different simulation um, uh, scenarios we looked at it. Uh, there are some individual train going connecting to the, the control center. Some that are going uh, in parallel, uh, same velocity and communicating among themselves. Here they're not going to the control center. Another scenario, you have different uh, velocity. Now one is connecting to access point and then access point coming to the next one. Trains going in the opposite directions, uh, two in parallel and they're sending information in the form of multimedia. Uh, we have different trains, different types of uh, traffic that they are sending. And what about if you are combining this WiMAX and some of the Wi-Fi type traffic in one area? How is that going to change that? So we looked at all these different scenarios and uh, provided the performance study for that. Also, we looked at it as you are going through this, how fast Okay, if this train is moving here, if it's between these two access points, it has to disconnect from the previous one and connect to the next one because it's getting closer to the next one. Is that going to drop the throughput as it's doing this handoff, what we call it, <coughs> handoff from the previous one to the next one? And we did the, our study and we saw that the, the throughput stays the same as we are changing. This step shows that here is connected to the first uh, AP, then is next one, the next one. This step shows that is connecting to the uh, each access point, but the throughput has stayed the same. This is for train moving at 70 miles per hour, the spacing the five kilometers between them, and the two the length of this is like 20 kilometers. And then we started looking at how much the load is that can support. Uh, typically, the, based on our experiment that we did, we can support up to 120 megabit, megabytes, which is a lot of information. A good application for a railroad will not exceed from that. Um, another thing that they wanted to do is they wanted to have these cameras that are on locomotive in real time streaming that information to the control center. Now, what they're doing now is recording information. For example, they come to the crossing, uh, highway railroad crossing. If anything happens, they have their cameras that is recording and they go look at it. What they wanted to do is stream that data over the network to the control center. <clears throat> so we did uh, some uh, image quality testing and uh, uh, how the fairness of that on the throughput and for both 802.16 and 802.11. And WiMAX is coming across really well. It doesn't drop at all. Wi-Fi drops. So uh, <clears throat> this was pretty good. Um, the WiMAX um, video thing, we did something in uh, around the Omaha, our campus. Um, we put the camera in our um, car, and then we have the WiMAX up of TKI, and we go around and try to stream the video through and that came through well. Um, it, here it shows, I have the video of that. Uh, I won't show you here, but if you want to see that, quality is really good. Uh, um, again, we did through the Elmwood Park, which is the um, uh, Omaha campus. Uh, the reason that we did Elmwood Park is, especially in the spring um, and fall, there are many trees over there. The color of these leaves are different. And we wanted to see how well we can capture the difference in different colors and in terms of the transmission. So that turned out pretty well. Uh, also, we drove in a road that uh, the trees are kind of far from the road and see what the impact of this. Uh, and in all of this that we did, um, uh, WiMAX turned out really well. Uh, this 802.16 is a WiMAX. If you look at the quality, it's pretty steady versus the Wi-Fi that had dropped. This is if you have a large number of stations. Here you went up to 16 stations that were transmitting video. So overall, with the WiMAX, what we got is um, the communication distance uh, 
is much better than Wi-Fi, uh, practically they can get about 10 miles between them, which 10 miles is good, but it's not the 30 miles that they were advertising. In terms of handoff, it's pretty good. Quality of service is pretty good, and some of those. Then we wanted to set up our WiMAX test bed. So a couple, two areas we picked. One is in Logan, Iowa. UP had a place over there, so they gave us a tower, and we put our antenna on top of that. The reason that I picked this area, this is in the farmland. You see these are all farms around it. And this road here, road 44, if you see that, this is pretty good. So here was the road that we could drive relatively fast, and there were some uh, curves here, and we monitored the performance of the WiMAX. And here you can see the coverage the, that we had from our antenna here was pretty wide, so we could do a testing. So we did a lot of testing here. Then the other uh, test that I have for WiMAX is in Ashland. Ashland, Nebraska, between Omaha and Lincoln. And uh, the reason for that was uh, this is giving us some coverage of I-80. The I-80 is good here. We can test it for higher speed. And also, Highway 6 is there. Um, if I can show this, the Highway 6 going there. And the I-80 here is, even though this the cover, the cover, the coverage is small um, area on I-80, but still we could go fast here because 75 miles, so we are pretty safe to go 80 miles and do the testing. Um, <clears throat> and also we wanted to do some testing in Ashland, in the, in the building, between different buildings, see how that, so that's another test bed that I have for the WiMAX there. So in summary, the railroads um, believe that um, WiMAX is a good solution even though it doesn't provide a 30 miles. The only sticky point on that is WiMAX operates in 2.5 gigahertz, which is, which is a license uh, frequency, so they have to get a license from that. We looked at another frequency for them, which is 3.65. It's different from 2.5. The difference, 2.5, the lower one, it gives us better coverage. When you go 3.65, the coverage is reduces a little bit, but it's still in terms of video and all that is pretty good. The advantage of 3.65 is that the railroad can get the license for that without paying any money to uh, Sprint and uh, clear wire. So they, this is the solution that they are looking at now. We are meeting every quarter with the, those railroads and the direction that FRA, Federal Railroad Administration, is going to recommend is a combination of uh, WiMAX for the track and Wi-Fi for yard, getting to the yard and around the yard. Uh, people ask me about, how about the other technology? We hear about 4G and all that. WiMAX, it is a 4G technology. They ask me about the LTE, LTE, what the, you hear on the advertisement from the AT&T and all that, that they're using LTE. LTE is more a cellular uh, technology. Uh, is used uh, basically using the same infrastructure that they have for cellular, which works well for cellular uh, communication, but not for the railroad environment, especially if you have those harsh railroad environment that we have. So, uh, based on what we provided to FRA and railroads, they are taking this WiMAX and now they are in the process of um, designing the hardware equipment that will go on the long side of the track to support uh, the communication. A um, couple of the crews that are working with me, some of these my graduate students, um, he graduated as assistant professor some uh, in the University of Massachusetts. Uh, Boston. Uh, he's the professor, uh, assistant professor in Thailand, and Dr. Hempel is uh, my research professor, and uh, this gentleman uh, retired. Uh, and uh, so, and these are some other graduate students that work with us. This is a car that we have. You see some of these antennas here, and, and uh, from that point, we learned that we need to take the university car for testing. This will give us. Uh, so hopefully that gave you an overview. I didn't go in a lot of technical issues on 
these models that we have done. Uh, but if you are interested, we have a few of these uh, uh, papers that are uh, available. IEEE transaction papers are there. And I have some video of that that uh, we can look at it. So I open it for questions. Yes, when you are uh, talking about uh, choosing the test bed and uh, for white max, about the IAT, and uh, so I wonder how is it related to your choosing of test bed? I mentioned about what? Uh, IAT. IAT, okay. And I will sure. Um, as I mentioned, one of the things that um, WiMAX was advertising uh, it, it supports communication at high speed. Uh, they mentioned that it supports up to 120 miles per hour. The Crete area that we had on Highway 55, we could not go over 75 miles. So I-80 gave us a chance that at least we can push that to speed. So we tried to, uh, we didn't go 120 miles. I don't tell you what we went, but we tested at the higher speed. So the I-80, even for you know the 15 miles or so, because it's under our coverage, we can test it for different velocity, especially high velocity. Are there any other questions? I have a question related to the security. Sure. How, in this test, did you look at ways that the data would be secure through these various networks? I mean, you know, that's a, uh, you know, something to always be concerned with this kind of data and the things that the railroad carries. Sure, excellent question. Very good. Um, each of these uh, uh, technologies, Wi-Fi and WiMAX, provide some security on it. Like Wi-Fi, when you're using here, you know, you have a security that is at the application layer. Um, WiMAX also provide security too. But there were some critical applications that the railroad wanted us to go beyond that. For example, their vision is at some point all the functionalities of the locomotive will be controlled remotely and through the wireless. In that case, they wanted to have truly a secure environment. Uh, actually, this is a part of what we are going to study next for that kind of application look at even in more detail security than what the standard is. But for most applications, they rely on the security that comes with the technology. Was there any collaboration with the uh, Department of Defense on some of this, with some of these things that they may have, or things that they could provide as test data or anything of that nature? No, not at this time, yeah. Great. Thanks, Amit. Uh, sure. I think the uh, it's always good to see. You know, when we do a intelligent transportation system, we often do it for roadways, and it's good to see the application for railways and understand that uh, that all modes are interested in this and that are making progress on it. Sure. Predict the future, but yes. <laughs> uh, you know, a lot of times when we work with technology, things catch up on you. Do you see anything on the horizon that will also be of use uh, to this kind of study? Thank you. The thing that I see is um, putting this WiMAX, again, requires a heavy infrastructure investment, meaning that they have to have these uh, poles, these antennas, every, we predicted every 10 to 15 months. Okay? Even in the future, if we push this to 20 months, still they have to have this. So what I see is the cellular network at some point truly be in a coverage that covers everywhere. If that covers, then the railroad don't have to invest that infrastructure themselves. But are we going to get to that point? Are the cellular providers interested in supporting an area that you may have 20 people living over there, putting the infrastructure over there? That's a question. In terms of the investment, in terms of the technology, 
always we are doing something in their communication. We are always pushing that envelope to have more data rate and better uh, error rate and and uh, better coverage. So um, there there is a standard that we refer to as 802.20, 802.11.802.20. Which is not a standard yet, but is a committee that are looking at that, and I'm a member of that. That may offer a different technology, but probably that's not till probably maybe seven, eight years, because the committee just started looking into that. Are there any other questions? One of the uh, big um, pushes right now are on connected vehicles. Right. Yes, right, sure. where we the roadway, mm -hmm. uh, the mm -hmm. vehicles are connected to the infrastructure. And it would seem to me, obviously, that the railway would be part of that as well. Does this work, uh, do you work in this area at all? Or do you see any uh, uh, any um, applicability to that connected sure. vehicle initiative? Thank you. That's a very good question. Um, you know, some of these uh, connectivity that I mentioned through Wi-Fi, because it supports mobility, that can be implemented in Wi-Fi. It's relatively inexpensive for communication between the vehicles and communication communication from vehicle to some stationary. Um, the issue is that um, when you are doing that, who is going to control information and some of the privacy issues that get involved here? But what I have done is I'm looking at um, one of the areas that I, I talked to you later. Uh, they're looking at uh, measuring the, the speed of the traffic in different congested area. So they measure, they mark a car from point A and how long it gets to get to point B. The way that people are doing this are two different methods. One method is these new cars, all of them have Bluetooth, and these Bluetooth are on. And uh, what you can do, you can have a passive device that monitor the uh, uh, Bluetooth and the address of that Bluetooth from one point, and then if you can do that in the, another point, you find out how long it has taken to go between that. That has kind of similar thing that we are doing. Um, um, I'm interested to do this not only with Bluetooth, because not all the cars have Bluetooth, the new ones do. But there are other elements in the car that they have some form of transmissions. That if you can capture that kind of transmission, transmission meaning is not really wireless. It's just the characteristics of the electromagnetic field that that engine generates. I can measure that and from point A to point B and do that. Um, so there are a lot of um, similarities between um, vehicle to vehicle and train to train. You know, the one that I showed, um, two trains are going in the opposite or parallel and how the communication between them is going to be, it comes back to two vehicles that are communicating to a, um, a base station on the side, how that transmission is going to impact that impact in the technical side. So yes, they're very, very much connected. So that's why we come to Matt to get your direction. <laughs> Thanks, Amin. Yes, sure. uh, well, thanks for giving a, a very good presentation. And uh, I'm, I'm so we'll have extra. I will see you around doing other work for Matthew in the future. So thank you. Sure. Thank you very much. I know you all graduate students working here uh, under the direction of Dr. Roulette. If you are interested in working in these uh, railroad things, uh, please let me know or contact uh, Dr. Roulette. They're always there. Uh, projects that the railroads are coming. Uh, Matt C has supported me for two projects. If you don't mind, maybe I can mention the project that is supported now. Uh, actually, this is a very interesting project. What we are trying to do, railroads came to us and uh, proposed this uh, to us that we do this study. You have a railroad track, and sometimes construction is going on on the track. And the construction worker are coming to fix something on the track. They don't want to shut down the whole track, but they have to know when the train is coming so they get their stuff out of the way. And you know that train coming at 70 miles an hour, they cannot stop right away. So they have to know that something is at least a mile, a mile and a half. And sometimes because of the turn and the tunnel, 
they cannot see where that uh, crew is. So the project that uh, Maxi and uh, Dr. Ouellette is supporting me is what we want to do is we put some sensors like a couple miles away, wireless sensor, that as the train go by, we detect the electromagnetic field that the locomotive generates. And then based on that, we can determine the velocity and the direction. And wirelessly, we can uh, give that information to the crew that uh, this train is coming and is going to be here in the next five minutes. Get out of the way or move your thing. People try to do this with cameras. You know, they have a high speed camera that you can see a mile away. But of course, through the curves and tunnels, that doesn't work. They try to do radar. It doesn't work because you have to be in the line of sight. Still, it has limitations. Um, so we are looking at uh, our solution. And, and uh, Union Pacific that supported us uh, with the match for the MAPSI. So I look forward that that would be that would make a big difference in terms of safety of the rail. What they are doing now, believe it or not, they tell me they, they put a person a mile away, and that person has to stand over there and watch if train is coming. But the problem is that person cannot have any distraction. They found out that sometimes the phones or whatever they have, sometimes they listen to music, and they're looking, but that music, their mind is somewhere else. And uh, then they banned everything, so these people cannot have anything on them. They just stand over there. But then they realize they get tired of standing over there for 45 minutes and looking at. So they step out, or their mind is somewhere else, and train comes. And so all kinds of problems. So it's really, truly a safety issue that, that we are looking at. Thank you very much. Thank you.